Heavenly Father, as we come to this part of the service, Lord, as we look on towards Thee, Lord, to whence, Lord, to have eyesight to see, Lord, and ears to hear, I thank you, Heavenly Father, for a place we can be at peace here, Lord. Lord, remember thy children, Lord, in Israel at this time, and as we look into your word, Lord, have your way, I pray, in Christ Jesus' name I ask, amen. You can see it this morning. <clears throat> listening to the news in, well, it's been a while, but I've been listening every day pretty well to see what's going on, and the spirit of the world is we got to get rid of ISIS, we got to get rid of Hamas, we got to get rid of all these spirits, and they are having ideas how they are going to do it. They don't even, and they don't know that they ought to look in God's word to see that how God is going to get rid of that those terrorist group, which are most of them are pretty well Muslim based, that that are the radicals. So, knowing those things, when I start looking at well, how many terrorist groups are there on the planet? And so they're not all in Israel concerning the Middle East and so forth. But across the world, there's over 74 different terrorist groups that want that are vying for some sort of change in their government, their lives, or or the way of of uh, the way things should go, the way they see it. But all it is is a cry of humanity. They want change. The only thing is, if they're if they're not saved or following God, they don't know how to go about it and waiting in God's plan for the change to come. I got news for them. There is going to be a great change, and that will be the millennium. There will be peace across the whole earth because Jesus will rule and reign. But as that is all playing out in the world, I'm glad God has given us understanding in the time we live in now that he's the one that's going to start the change. First of all, he's doing the change in us, getting us ready. So he has to have something ready in place. He's getting Israel ready to be in, in her place. And as we are moving towards that time of the end, it's not a 50 years off, and it's not going to be tomorrow, but I'm thankful that God has given us eyes to see where we're at at the time we live in. It's good to know you're saved and we should be walking with the Lord in as much as it is within us to do so. And I'm thankful you put that scripture there that we have it in measure and that measure he'll surely fit us, fit it in to that bride of Jesus Christ. So we don't pattern ourselves after one another but we pattern ourselves after the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you pattern yourself after one another you might see some flaws that you might not like. But if we pattern ourselves after Jesus Christ, then we're on the right track. Because your brothers and sisters, doesn't matter whether they're old or young, going down that road, we all need some improvement. If we were all like Jesus Christ, like Jesus Christ was, the bride would be raptured now. But I'm thankful that he's concerned on us. That's why we have a high priest and advocate. But my message this morning, I want to turn to in Ezekiel chapter 37. While I was out west in Manitoba, in one of the sermons, that was one part of it was relating to the miracle war. And so that night, Brother Lyle had a dream. And he, the next service, he related it, 
what he saw, and he was brought to the scripture in Ezekiel about a great army. And when he said that, something just clicked. I said, there's something there. And so, in looking at it, this morning we're going to look at what did God show Ezekiel? Where does it fit? I believe it will add more to the picture that we're looking at. To begin with, it's in the 37th chapter. And when we are looking at Ezekiel 37, when he's talking about the valley of dry bones, remember, he's in a vision. And he's seeing something symbolic. And God wants to show him in a symbolic form how he's going to bring and establish a nation of Israel. Ezekiel 37 from 1 to 14 parallels to the parable Jesus was speaking about the fig tree as being a symbol and an example of the nation of Israel as well. These two scriptures go hand in hand together. It is symbolic. Now, you can't take that and read. Now, if we were just someone in the world, oh, Valley Dry Bones, I wonder where that is. I'll try to find it on Google, see where it's at. It, you won't find it. God's given it as a, sim, as a vision to let Ezekiel know in his day what was going to take place. Now, why was Ezekiel given this vision? By the time Ezekiel had that vision, the ten northern tribes had been taken away, and he's there in Israel, and he sees the deserted areas and so forth. And he's probably wondering why, Lord, why, what's happening to the nation? So now God gives Ezekiel a vision, and as we're going to read now, he says, And the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out into the Spirit, and the Lord set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. Well, had you been shown a valley full of bones, you would have wondered, what is this all about? Why bones? <laughs> but remember, it's a vision. It's not an actuality. And he caused me to pass by round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. In other words, they had no life in it whatsoever, no, no sinew that was on it. They were just been there for a long time, representing how the nation of Israel, when it was cut off, would be a long time without God, without that nation being in their land. You have to look at this vision as the nation, not as an individual, a person that he puts a bone upon another bone and so forth. It's, it's in reference to the nation. And he said, son unto me, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord, thou knowest. Now that's just like a Jew. You ask a Jew a question he don't know, he says, well, you know. They're asking you for the answer without, or as a reply, asking a question before, with a question. And he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now as God now is showing Ezekiel, he's going to do something about these bones. Now remember, this is the nation. Thus saith the Lord, unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Oh my, God's going about to do something. And I will lay sinew upon you, and will lay and bring up upon flesh upon you, and cover you with skin. And put breath into you, and ye shall live. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. So God is showing Ezekiel in a symbolic vision form. He's going to cause this. Not to, it's not instantaneous, but it shows a progression how God was going to be dealing with the nation of Israel, how he would take bones by bone upon bone, starting little by little, and how he would add sinew to it. And then finally he's going to put his spirit into, into it. 
Now, if putting his spirit into it, don't look at it as they're being baptized with the Holy Ghost. It's his spirit moving upon them to do something. And I beheld, and lo, the sinew and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said he unto me, prophesied unto the wind. And prophesy to the son of man, and uh, sorry, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. It's in reference to where Israel has been scattered throughout the nations, the winds, and he's bringing them into the place, to, in the land of Israel. But he's going to breathe breath to them. He's going to give them life. So remember, this is symbolic. You can, uh, this here, you can only take it so far. You can't go for it. It's not a shadow. It's a type. Now here's the scripture that I'll really start to look at. And so I prophesied as he commanded me. And the breath came unto them. And they lived. And they stood on their feet, an exceeding great army. Now we know how God has brought the nation of Israel in 1948. It was declared a nation. How that God dealt miraculously for them to get a foothold of that of, in the land of, of Israel. Only had a little part that was given to them by a UN. But then by 1967 now, God starts a, miracle war, a, a miraculous war in, in a form because God was involved in it. They had more land and got the city of Jerusalem. But we're looking at another war, a war that's coming up the road. But in, in Ezekiel's vision, he sees the bones. The bones start to come together. Flesh starts to come upon them. And then God says, I'm going to breathe life into them. And the next stage, the last stage, he says, I see them as a mighty, great army. Now, from the things that we've learned and the things that God has shown us in this hour, where would you fit this mighty, great army? Is a question. Is it just out there somewhere and you can pick and choose where you want it? No, you can't. When we look at the week of Daniel, Israel has no army. They're, the 144,000 are going to be fleeing. The woman's going to go and flee also. She flees to the wilderness, which is America. So nowhere does Israel, because remember, the vision Ezekiel has seen here, the valley of dry bones, is concerning that nation. So Israel will not be a mighty army in that week of Daniel whatsoever. Now as we go backwards from there, coming back in time, the next major event that would be on the, on the place before the week of Daniel starts, and that starts by the Antichrist signing the covenant, you have preceding that the Ezekiel War. Would that be a place where that great army would be? You that have looked at Ezekiel 38 and 39, it is God himself. He destroys five-sixths of that arm, invading armada that comes in, and he leaves one-sixth of the testimony to show that when they go back home, to show that Jehovah, the God of Israel, is God, and he's going to famish the, that Muslim belief out of that of those uh, that. Allah out of their minds. So that great army is not here. But there is a great army in... Okay. But when we come to the miracle war, that's where this scripture fits. There's a contender on the Valley of Dry Bones. But it was never brought concerning where did that great army fits. And that great army 
That's going to be, God calls it an exceedingly great army. Now, what's going to make it so exceedingly great? It's God being involved with it. But there's scriptures I want to bring in this morning. And I'll just read them for the sake of time. You can just maybe mark them down. You can read on your own. In Psalm 68, verse 1, it says, Let God arise. Let his enemy be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. So it shows that how God, when he comes, he's going to deal with his enemies. That's not the scripture, but I'm just laying a base here. And it says, As smoke is driven away, verse 2, so drive them away as wax melt before the fire. So let the wicked perish at the presence of God. Now he's using now in Psalms, David is given this reference. Yes, it those things happened in the days of Moses when they came across the Red Sea. But that is also in the same manner that God's going to be involved in that miraculous war. Remember that amber glow that's going to come when that war starts. Man is going to see, God's going to bring back that pillar of fire. He's going to burn. They can't go through that pillar of fire wherever God sets a wall to protect Israel while she's mopping up in her land and as he goes through the different part of that miraculous war. I don't want to preach the whole miraculous war this morning, but it's, it's in contenders and it's, we have charts and so forth. So now we see that here, this, this part here about God coming on the scene doesn't make that army great yet. Because we're talking about natural men. But God's going to have an army on site and in the 17th verse of that same chapter. And the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. And the Lord is among them as in Sinai in his holy place. As he was in Sinai, he will be doing again. As. So he's in the past reference. And God has used his angels on the battlefield at different points of time in through man's history. He is going to be doing the same thing. When he comes, when God comes, he doesn't come alone. Those angelic beings come with him. Now verse 34 of that same Psalms chapter 68. Ascribe ye strength unto God, his excellency over Israel, and his strength is in the cloud. Why is he coming as a cloud? Because if God came in his invisible, God is invisible, he's everywhere present. So they wouldn't know that he's on the scene. So he's coming with that presence of a cloud. If that miraculous war is coming on ground, God's going to make his presence known, not just saying, oh, I'm there and I'm watching over in the spirit world and you can't see a thing. He's going to have himself present in that war. But now, look at this. O oh God, thou art terrible out of that holy place, out of thy holy place. For the God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. And that is at the climax or the peak of things when we're looking at Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 10 where God says there's an exceeding great army. They're, the reason that's so great, they're going to be anointed. Not with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, but the presence and the power of God on them. Just like when Samson was a, was a jawbone, how he killed so many Philistines. That was the power of God that was on him that, that done those things. So God is going to do something even with the army, the natural army of Israel. He's going to put his power and spirit in them along as that's having at the same time the angelic army on sight and himself too being visible in the form of a cloud. Nowhere else does it say, God says, well, there is one place when, when we do come with the Lord Jesus Christ. But aside from that, this is the only place where God says, this is an exceeding great army. You'll find in Scripture in different places, mighty men, great army, but not exceeding. 
But God's saying he's going over the limit with this one. Brothers and sisters, we're going to see something that the world, even from days of old, have not seen through the manner or the scope what God's going to be bringing on the ground. Now, with this exceeding great army, in Numbers, if you want to mark it down, 24 and 18, it talks about how God's going to use Israel at the end time that the man, man should consider. It says, Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemy. And Israel shall do valiantly. Oh, what's that word? We, we heard, it's not, it's not using our terminology today. Valiant means extreme bravery. So Israel will do extreme bravely. That goes hand in hand. You put that scripture along with Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 10. Exceedingly, valiantly, God is speaking about. You'll find that word valiantly in Psalm 60 and 12, verse 12. Though God shall, through God, through God, see, we shall do valiantly, for he it is that shall th- thread down our enemies. In Psalms 118, verse 15, And the voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacle of the righteous. The right hand of God does violent, valiantly. The right hand, he's give, who is given valiantly, authority is what it is. Now, I'm going to be going somewhere else with this in a minute, so just hang on. In Zechariah chapter 10, now, verse 3. My anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the goats. For the Lord has visited his flock of the house of Judah and he's made them as his goodly horse in battle. Now the goodly horse is not just in the miracle war. God used that goodly horse in 48. That was Judah that went in there as the primary uh, tribe that went in. It was Judah in 1967 that won through God using them, won that, that war in 67 in six days. And that tribe of Judah is going to be the predominant one in this miracle war because the ten northern tribes only come when are they fulfilling the ranks? After that miracle war because now God has given Israel all the land and so these ten northern tribes can come into the land where they ought to be. And Israel will no longer be two stick, but one stick is this prophesied in Ezekiel here. That's when they come together. Well, praise the Lord. Now, when we read Ezekiel chapter 37, the book of Ezekiel, how many know that from chapter 1, to the last chapter. As Ezekiel is dealing, God is dealing with Ezekiel in those, in that, in that, in those chapters in Ezekiel, they pretty well go in sequence of time as he's going through the chapters. It's more or less sequential. How many knew that? Now, sometimes it refers to something in, as far as the spirit side of things, and sometimes it talks about the natural side of things. But all in all, when you're looking at Ezekiel, you're starting from a certain start point till the end. It's not a coincidence that Ezekiel, chapter 37, is before chapter 38. It's not a coincidence that the miracle war is before the Ezekiel war. Chapter 37 is your miracle war. Chapter 38 is your your Ezekiel war. 
You see it? So it puts emphasis, when should that miracle war be? Why do you say it's before Ezekiel? Because of Ezekiel here. First of all, there's a whole lot of scriptures that we would have to describe in order to be in Ezekiel. The whole tribe has to be home. But just in the simple references that we're looking at Ezekiel, chapter 37, it's speaking about that great army. And then the next chapter in Ezekiel 38, you're talking about God destroying Gog and Magog. So 37 is your miracle war. Ezekiel 38 is chapter 38. Right in sequence. Ain't that wonderful? It's been there all along. Praise God. All right. Now I want to go to Joel. Joel, the second chapter. You got Daniel, Hosea, and then Joel. When we're looking at Joel, the second chapter from verse 12 right through the end, it's how God is showing things that are going to be happening when he picks up Israel till the time that that the day of the Lord comes. And we've been through some things before in Ezekiel, the second chapter. Just as a point of reference, well, maybe, no, I better, I don't want to throw too many things to confuse there. Verse 21. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice. For the Lord will do Great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pasture of the wilderness do spring. For the tree bears her fruit, and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. So God's looking at an overall picture how the land of Israel. He's coming into the land, and he says he's going to be doing great things. This is over the period of time from 45 to about where that miracle war is going to happen. It's a general overlay of the picture that he's looking at. Be uh, Be glad, then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice, for the Lord has given unto you the former rain and the latter rain to cause to come down unto you, for you, sorry, the rain, the former and the latter rain in the first month. Now God is now speaking at the point in time where they're going to be in the week of Daniel. And that's why that revelation in the first month can only be when that week of Daniel begins. God has opened that since 2005, not year 2000. In the first month, that's when, now God is speaking at the, at the part where the week is beginning. He says, in that first month, you're going to get the former rain and the latter rain. That's where the 144,000 are going to be sealed with the Holy Ghost. The woman's going to receive the, the message. That's where they're going to accept Jesus Christ as, as their, their Savior, the Messiah. I should say, the Messiah, receive him as the Messiah. Because they'll see the nail scarred hand in, in his hands. Will that be the physical Jesus there? No. It will be an angelic being bringing a vision of Jesus and not just to one person, but to all that's there. Because it says not just one was weeping, they were all weeping. That's not in the scripture here, but that's in, in further on in Zechariah. Now, where I want to get to is a little further down. And the floor shall be full of wheat and fat and overflowing with wine and oil. That's in the beginning of that 70th week, as far as the spiritual side of things. Because remember, he's given them the former and the latter rain. And when we talk about 
overflowing of fat and oil and, and wine to oil and wine. What is it to us? It's symbolic of the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God has given to us. That's what it does. We get fat, not physically, but spiritually. <laughs> Now here, I believe this goes along with this scripture here this morning. And I will restore unto you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palma worm, and my great army which I sent among you. Now the scripture brings to the time of the Babylonian Empire the Media Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and the Roman Empire, which are symbolized by the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palm worm. But then God says He's going to restore them, and He talks about a great army. That great army was not in the time of the Babylonian Empire, neither the Media Persian Empire neither the Grecian, neither the Roman Empire, but here at the end time in that miracle war, that's what that great army is right here. It goes along with Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 10. That great army. I don't look stunned this morning. Can you see the picture? So God is just looking back saying, here's what the canker worm and, the, and the, all these locusts and these things have done. But then I've sent my great army. And it's through that great army. Because the preceding verse to, the, to this verse here, he's talking about their blessing. So he says, in order for you to get the blessing, yes, I know that you were in captivity in Babylon. I know what the mighty person did to you. I know what the Christian done to you. I know what the Roman Empire done to you. But now through that great army, you're in your land. And ye shall eat in plenty. Not potatoes, apples, and such like, although God blesses them in the natural side of things. And satisfy and praise the name of the Lord thy God that has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Why will they never be ashamed? All down through history of time, Israel says, God, God is great. And if we bring that to our hour today, is Israel says, our God is great. The Muslim says, he's a dog. Allah is supposed to be great. And they bring reproach on Israel. Where's your God, Israel? Can't he do anything? Huh? But when that miracle war has happened and they've seen something on, on ground, that pillar of fire, that army, and God anointing that Israeli army when he, he puts them out to, in that miracle war, they're going to see something and no longer will they reproach, Israel, where's your God? In Micah it says the same thing, chapter 7. In the days thy wall is going to be built. Of that temple. God's going to take the reproach away from them. And they shall be no more than, sorry. And Lord your God else, my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come afterwards. Now he was in verse 27, is in reference to when the shame is removed, you are now in that miracle war time. But he says, afterwards, somewhere afterwards, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, upon your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions, and, up, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaid, in those days will I pour out my spirit. Yes, it has a reference to in the days of Pentecost, but this is to the day in the first month in the land of Israel. It's speaking to the nation of Israel because he says after the miracle war, this is what's going to be done to you, Israel. And this is where the 144,000 are going to be sealed with the Holy Ghost. Now it's not just an anointing upon them, he's going to seal them. 
Because they are going to get visions. They are going to get dreams. We're not just the special, special ones here with the bride that God's doing things. Or the, in the early church in the day of Pentecost. But God's going to do something fantastic for those Jews when that week of Daniel begins and it starts to go. Now I want to turn back to Ezekiel 37. As you go from verse 15 on down, he talks about how the two sticks have come together. And now there's the ten tribes, the ten northern tribe with the two thousand tribes. How God has put all things in there. But here's what I'm looking at, verse 28. Remember that miracle war is before Ezekiel 38, 39. And in verse 28, it says, And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel. When my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Now, if we look at that scripture right, when his sanctuary, when that temple is built at the time of the miracle war, not a brick, not a stone. It's going to destroy that third temple when it's built after the miracle war. There's no, nothing in the Ezekiel war that's going to touch that temple. Because God said it's going to be forevermore. Then when we come to, to a, the middle of the week, when we have Armageddon, not one stone is going to be touched on that temple. Yet 200,000 men are slain in the valley of Armageddon, where Armageddon, just real, where Armageddon is at. Yet, even after that, when the Lord comes in the day of the Lord, and the planet reels to and fro, and the planets move back and forth, and the cities of the nations, they fall, the temple stands. And at the end of this all shaking, when Jesus comes to put his foot on the Mount of Olives, which is not too far from that temple, the mountain splits in two. That temple's not disturbed. To me, in that day of the Lord, when Jesus puts his foot on that Mount of Olives and the mountain cleaves, it splits into two, it's the end of the shaking of those 75 days. Because what... You're, you're not going to have earthquakes and tremors in the millennium when he's trying to judge the, the goats from the sheep. There's no earthquake mentioned in, in the whole thousand years or the eternal age. Because when this planet has finished reeling and rocking and the plates and everything is set in place, it's going to be there for a long time. And God will see to it to keep it. Are you enjoying this this morning? Can you see? To me, that was a beautiful picture in Ezekiel 37, verse 10. An exceeding great army. On ground, we know where it fits time-wise now. That's going to be here. Oh, my. I'm glad that he shares with us his thoughts. Those thoughts of God that he brings truth to us. As he, his spirit, reveals it to us, we are putting the revelatory garment on. Do you know, need to know every detail? No, but we must see the same picture. Because if you could see every detail, everyone would be a preacher. What would that be like? Another thing, 
when God deals with Israel and he seals it with the Holy Ghost. In Revelation chapter 7, God, in verse 4, they have their father's name in their forehead. How do they get it there? By being sealed with the revelation, being sealed by the Spirit of God. Will they have the revelation we have? No. God's requiring them the light of one day. We have the light of seven days in the hour that we live in. But that don't make us any better than them or the apostles in the first age. It's just we see more of the plan of God. It's not that you got more of the Holy Ghost because you see more. Well, praise the Lord. And our battle today is not some, well, there is, depends where you live, they try to kill you. But our battle's in the mind. Brother Bram spoke a message, the greatest battle ever fought in the mind. And that's where God wants to work. If you can't get access, if God can't get access to the mind, then you're not going nowhere. It's just like students in a classroom. If the teacher can't reach to them in their mind what he's trying to explain, then they're just filling a seat. The teacher might be interesting or it might be boring. You can tell when it's boring. Time to dismiss or whatever it is. Everybody's fidgeting around, ready, getting ready for the word, hearing for the word go. <laughs> but if it's something interesting, you want to, you cherish what you receive. And God's the same way. It has to be his spirit that takes what's on ground and open up our heart. Now I start to see the picture. We don't see it overnight. And as I was speaking to my brothers and sisters in Australia, they're starting to see a greater picture. They see, now I see things, how they fit more and more. They're growing. It's a joy to speak to them. Praise the Lord. It's like doing the old Bible study. How many enjoyed it in those days? I did. We grew a lot. We learned a lot. But we could only go at God's pace. And it has its purpose. Praise the Lord. But surely we're nearing the end now. And because in nearing the end, God saw fit that to every one of us, he will make us to be there in place. Because that's the promise. It says we're sealed not to the next month or the next revelation. You and I are sealed till the day of our redemption. Redemption. So don't let the devil get on your back. Well, you're falling short. You've done this and that this week. You've been all over doing everything but the right thing. And the devil really likes to really come on your, on your shoulder and say, look, hey, you're doing a lot of wrong things, you know. I remember when I first came to salvation, way back in 74. Yes, I've, I hadn't read much of the Bible until <clears throat> I came across at the time that God started to deal with me. But then when there became a hunger... And in a short while, he filled me with his spirit. And my, that was wonderful. I was drunk in the spirit that I didn't know to put on the right boot or the wrong boot. Now, not everybody's experience is going to be like that. But I'm just saying there is a place where you know you have been born again. But then it came to the place, everything was going smooth. My, oh, there seemed to be no trouble. Everything, wow, this is beautiful, Lord. The devil comes along and he says, everything going fine with you? Oh, yes. You know, I'm just I'm living here. He says, uh, do you know if you haven't been tested, you're a bastard, not a child of God? Oops. 
I couldn't see no test since I was born again. That was the first test. He's tried to get you off track what you believe. The battle in the mind. And it went for a little space. God tries, tries to see, what are you going to do with it? Now that you've been, you're being tested, are you going to hold true? Or are you going to give up and go back? And when it has its work, when you come out on the other side, God affirms you're his, you've been tested and you've passed the test. That's test. Well, that was test number one for me. He says, you haven't been tested. He brought me to Hebrews where that scripture was. And I, I even looked at it and read it. My, I said, whoa, Lord, what's going on? I wasn't, even re- I wasn't realizing I was in the test myself at that point when he was doing that. And sometimes those tests has the part to kill something in the inner, inner part of us to make us trust him. But I want the answer now, in 10 minutes at least, Lord. No, not 10 minutes. Till that trial has had its work, then he settles us. If God took the trouble, the great eternal spirit, to test his only begotten son, to see what he would do when, he, when God would give him a word or a vision. Jesus, what are you going to do with this? Are you going to jump, run, or misuse it, or whatever the case may be? No, he held true. Of course, he's the perfect example. You and I can sometimes run here and there. But I'm thankful that God, he saw everything we're going to do right from the foundation of the world. And we should take confidence that if he sealed us, he sealed us till the day of our redemption. You can't be lost. A true child of God can't be lost. That's that's wonderful. <laughs> but between where that's given to you and you know you're sealed to that day, there's a lot of things going to go up and down till you get to the place where he brings you, ho- you and me home. I feel good. I, I don't know about you, but I get hungry. When I, when I see that nugget, that exceedingly great army, And more or less, the Lord says, where are you going to put it? Huh? It just adds to the picture. Amen. Praise God. Well, that's all I have for this morning. Let's just stand and look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that your spirit continually, Lord, to work upon each and every one of us, Lord. We realize, Lord, that you have a plan. But, Lord, let us walk faithfully as we go towards that place till the rapture would come. Bless thy nation, Israel, Lord, this time. I ask it in your precious name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You can have the musicians to come. You can be seated. Still has a need.
Praise the Lord. When I look back, when Brother Jackson passed away, the first thing in my mind, what are we going to do? But the Lord knew, just like in the days of when Jesus was on earth, he had to go away so that these, the apostles and the, and the fivefold ministry in that hour to get their feet. It's not uplifting, it's God's plan, so praise the Lord. Let's just stand at this time. Uh, Brother Ray, would you come and dismiss us in a word of prayer this morning? Heavenly Father, thank you for their wonderful goodness to us. Thank you for this time of being together. Father, as we dismiss, go our several ways. Give us traveling mercies. Be with your children this day. Dismiss us with your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.